You know, music may well be one of the most powerful mediums for conveying thoughts and the feelings of the heart ever to exist. The French author Victor Hugo once mused that music expresses that which cannot be put into words and that which cannot remain silent. While the Bard of Avon, William Shakespeare, wrote, If music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. Even philosophers have considered the power of music, such as Friedrich Nietzsche, who remarked, And those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. Often our musical education begins as a child. I can remember staring at the bottom two shelves of the four foot by eight foot bookcases that my father built that housed his record collection. Now if I had to guess, I'd say there were no less than 300 albums in his collection supplemented by weekly trips to Turtles Records and Tapes in Austell or Oz Records in Marietta. Pick a musical style, pick an artist, my father had something, at the very least, similar to it. Much of my childhood was spent with a book in hand listening to albums and singles in the living room of our home. Those, you remember singles, right? <laughs> Not digital singles, but like they're on vinyl. They're about, you know, seven inches across. You had to have that special little thing that would go in the middle of your record player so that you could play those instead of the albums, right? We remember those. Some of us. Some of us. But I remember my mother would play those, or, or she would play mixtapes uh, during the day while she cleaned. And on weekends, it was pretty common for us to listen to music between sporting events or on television. And uh, if we had just been to the record store, I can remember coming home and having impromptu listening parties with whatever we had bought. Everyone sitting around, and we'd listen to the music, and then we'd review it and decide which songs had good arrangements and which ones had good lyrics and what we liked and inevitably what we would end up putting on our mixtapes because those were what we used in the car. When we went to visit relatives or we went on vacation, we listened to everything from Motown to country to album rock. All of those things found their way out of the speakers of various station wagons we owned through the years. And I can remember the dry Georgia heat blowing over our heads and me lying back in the seat listening to the Big Chill soundtrack or Bob Seger live at Cobo Hall and Waylon Jennings' Honky Tonk Heroes. The music was so etched in my mind that even today I can still recall the lyrics to the songs with just a few bars of music from the beginning. Now all of these memories of music if I channel them and I follow them, they all go back to one very simple song that I remember before I remember anything else on that nostalgic playlist that I just mentioned. It's a simple chorus that my grandmother, my nana, used to sing to me. It goes like this. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And she would sit and sing that over and over and over. Watch me tap my little feet. And I just thought it was a wonderful thing. Even as she got on up in years, I can remember her singing it under her breath, bedridden for most of the last part of her life. Just every so often, I'd just start singing it under her breath. That simple little chorus is etched in my memory. It's the first thing that I remember learning to sing. It still brings back memories of my grandmother. This simple, traditional folk song made popular in the Sidney Poitier film, Lilies of the Field. It had its origins even further back than that as a spiritual, sung out of the pain and hope of an enslaved people. It's a modern representation of a musical form we call a psalm. And that is the subject of our sermon series that we start today. And so the question I guess we need to ask, we, we see this word all the time. We refer to these uh, passages of Scripture from the Old Testament. 
But what exactly is a psalm? What exactly is a psalm? Well, James May writes that the psalms comprehend the complexity of human life, the variety in the Bible, the elements of doctrine of salvation, and the dimensions of the divine human communication. That's not the short answer, by the way. The short answer is quite simply, they are the songs that Israel sang in their worship of God. Each psalm or each song is a part of the corporate stories and the worship of the Jewish people. Their experience written in the form of poetry and set to music. Think of it as a Columbia House catalog that everyone got a free subscription to. Or for those of you who are too young to remember what that is. An Amazon Unlimited subscription that gives you access to all the streaming music on Amazon. You can pick your life circumstances, your place in the journey at the moment, and find a psalm that fits the bill. Psalms are an important way to express the ideas of the people who followed the God they called Adonai as they journeyed from being a handful of people uh, following the head of their family, Abraham, to the slavery of Egypt, to the promised land of Canaan, to the great monarchies of David and Solomon and back into captivity in Babylon, and finally into the diaspora, the scattering after Rome and the synagogue. All of these stories, the mythos of the people who became known as the Israelites, are contained in numerous ways in these 150 pieces of poetry set to music. They also became, along with the prophecies of Isaiah, part of the backbone of the New Testament. These two texts are quoted more often than any others in the New Testament collection, and they provide the Gospels with much of their connection to the Jewish people and the Jewish worship, such as when Jesus is on the cross and he begins to scream aloud, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, if you look back to Psalm 22, you'll find where he got those words. From then until now, the psalms have been a part of corporate worship. Many of the songs we sing, whether we sing from hymnals or psalters or chord sheets, have reference to, if not outright quotations, from the psalms. Hymnal favorites like, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, and praise to the Lord the Almighty. And even more contemporary songs like Blessed Be Your Name and You Are Good are songs that have incorporated the lyrics and the feeling and the emotion behind these songs. They also act in ways that express the social histories and the ethics that have been passed down through generations. A sort of spiritual disciplines guidebook, if you will. They're a means of defining godly character and how that character should find voice and action in the life of the child of God. They are sources of prayer and meditation that lead us into ways of being and living, nurturing the soul of the individual and the community. As one man puts it, when the community praises, it submits and reorders life. It is not only a moment of worship, but also an embrace of a doxological life, in other words, a life of praise, which is organized differently. So the summons is actually a summons to reorient life. It's our way of learning to live a life that is, as Paul says, a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This which is our appropriate priestly service. Now, as we come to our first psalm in the series this morning, we find words that are familiar in many ways. Words that breathe a familiar uh, faith of simple trust, of glad surrender, a res- faithful responsiveness. This is not a psalm that you would expect to be sung by newcomers who are just now embracing the faith, but by those who are seasoned veterans of the journey, those who are at home, in our faith and in a life of piety. Nor is it sung by those who are alienated and have cause against God or against neighbor. 
This song, this song sings that we walk daily through a creation that God loves and that God loves us. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The psalm sings that God's character is different than those other gods, money, success, youth, who would seek to rule over us. The Lord is a God whose character is marked by, marked by steadfast love and by faithfulness. Now with this in mind, let's look deeper into these words, deeper into the psalm itself. The psalm introduces itself as a psalm of thanks. So often in the life of Israel, they came to places where they saw God performing great deeds on their behalf. And their response was to sing or declare their praise for the work of God. Often seeing it as the literal salvation or physical saving of the people. Now, whether this was the case or not, we don't know. But human nature being what it is, I would guess that the psalm was written after God once again delivered either the people as a whole or an individual who had written it from something very difficult. The psalm, Psalm 100, is broken up into two sections. There are four verses which are called praise and worship. And then the final verse which offers the reason for why we praise. In that call to worship, there are several imperative statements. These are statements that are kind of like you must. Anybody remember English? Remember what? Uh, yeah, I know you remember. Of course you do. <laughs> And they remember English because of you. So there you go. Um, but in English, an imperative statement is one of those statements where somebody says, you do this. In other words, if I were to say, go into the fellowship hall, that's an imperative statement. What I mean is, you go into the fellowship hall. It's an expectation. It's a statement made with the understanding that when I tell you to do this or when someone tells you to do it, you're going to go do it. And so the psalm itself has these imperatives. And these imperatives are intended to lead the individual into the presence of God, which is the first and fundamental human act that constitutes worship. We are called to shout, to serve, to come, to know, to enter, to thank, and to bless with a conclusion in the final verse that explains why we do these things. Now the first imperative in verse 1 is shout. An imperative that we see all throughout the Psalms. If you read through the Psalms, you're going to see this word shout over and over and over show up. What they're saying is declare. Declare. In other words, when they said shout, they had these people that would come out and stand outside of the temple. And they would blow these horns. And every time they blow a horn, somebody would yell. And they would yell something like, God is good. And they would just, people would put their hands up like this. And they would just yell. They would go, God is good. It would be like that. And people, that's what they mean by shout. If you do that while we're doing the hymns, it's perfectly okay. I'm not going to get upset with you. If you want to, it's all right. It just lets me know that you're, that you're awake and that there's some feeling behind it. I'm good with it. But that's an imperative call. And it gets the mindset of the worshiper in the right place. The characteristic first part of a hymn of praise is the summons. It is to, pr to praise is to reject all alternative loyalties and false definitions of reality. So what we're saying when we're shouting like that, we are making a declaration. We are saying that we ourselves believe in the God that we're singing about, the God that we're speaking about. It is a public declaration of faith. That's one of the reasons why when people join the church or when we have confirmation or when we do baptisms, we do it in front of everybody. That's essentially a way of shouting. It's eventually, uh, essentially a way of saying that we are making a public decision, an identification with what we believe, and here it is. For the Israelites, that came in the form of simply standing out and yelling out what it was. 
in calling the earth and its people to shout triumphantly to the Lord. The psalmist is calling them not only to make it a public declaration, but to direct their worship to God and no other. God and no other. So when we do that, what we're saying is we are here to worship God. No other gods, none of those others that I mentioned, money, wealth, success, any of that. We are here to worship God and God alone. The next call that we have is the call to serve. But not just with the drudgery of some worker drone. We work to celebrate our efforts brought about by the joy that we feel by being in the presence of God. This idea of service is, is not something that's, that's going to, well, i got to go to church. Oh, well, where's my tie? Oh, wait, I forgot. Pastor doesn't care about ties. I just put on a nice shirt. Okay, I'm dressed. Let's go. I'm ready. Here we are. Okay, what do I got to do? No, it's not that kind of thing. It's, hey, I'm glad to be here. I want to be here. It's a life of joy born out of the next thing, which is that we have come before the Lord. Now, as we come before the Lord, we are in the presence of Almighty God. Being in that presence should be the driving force behind the gladness and the joy that leads us to serve. As we are in that presence, we continue with service. We continue with the shouting. And as we begin worship with these first three things, we make acknowledgement. We know that the Lord is good. And so we make acknowledgement that God is the Lord, the only God to be worshipped. For them, they had to do that in a land of polytheistic nations. Believe it or not, we're still worshipping God in a polytheistic nation. Don't believe me? Look at what people spend their time doing. You spend the majority of your time with your God, whatever it is. And for many of us, we don't even realize that we're polytheist. We simply find ourselves spending the majority of our time focused on something else. But they came. And they made the acknowledgement. That was what the shouting was about. That was what the service was about. That was what being in the presence of God was about. It was the acknowledgement that they worshipped Adonai, God alone. They entered into the gates of the temple. Now the way this worked was you, you, you walked into the gates. And as I said before, people were shouting. People were blowing horns. People were singing. And as you enter into the gates... Of the temple, you offered thanks. You offer praise. As you came into the courtyard, because you knew you were coming into the presence of God. You knew you were coming in the presence of God's people. And they lifted up a shout of praise. They lifted up uh, thanks to God. We see this in a spiritual sense in our own day. But in the day of the psalmist, it was quite literal. Israel had two houses, two kings. The call of the psalmist is one made by the king of heaven, whose house, the temple, sat next to the Davidic king of Israel. In the same way that we might come into the presence of an earthly king with humility and praise, one was to come with greater humility and praise before the Lord of heaven and all creation. Service was an expectation of all servants, and the offering of praise and thanks was the expected behavior of the servant before their master, their king. There's a confessional mode of being. And by confessional, what we mean is that you literally speak what you believe. Speak both with your voice and with your life what you believe and how you're going to live. This was implicit in this humility and praise. The people who came before the Lord are confessing by their acknowledgement that Adonai is Lord. This confessional is central to the reason for worship in verse 5. We worship because the Lord is good. We worship because His love lasts forever. We worship because His faithfulness lasts 
through generations. These declarations at the end of the psalm provide us with the why. All of the other stuff is the what. It's the how. When you get to the end of the psalm, you're getting the why. Why? Because God is good. Because His love is forever. Because His faithfulness lasts through generations. Because, in other words, we express all of this because God has shown us who He is and that He loves us. That's the modus, the, 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 the reason for all of this. These imperatives and this confession become, as we said before, a spiritual practice in imitation of our forefathers, a continuation of the worship offered in the temple in days past. As we practice, it becomes a worship of remembrance brought into the present and practiced in this moment. One writer draws on this theme saying, doxology as remembering puts life in perspective, affirms it is a gift, not an achievement, offers past out of which to assess the present and evoke a new, different future. We continue in this heritage of doxology, of literally studying and practicing praise as followers of Jesus. And that is our call. Our call is to hear these imperatives. Our call is to respond to the imperatives because we know that God is good, that His love lasts forever, and His faithfulness lasts through generations. And so our challenge will be this as we go through this series, that these psalms would become the songs of our heart that lead us into doing this. Psalm 100 is a, is a call to worship and a rationale for worship. As we enter into this time of the summer of psalms, I'd like for us to remember this psalm as our springboard. That it gives us the how and the what, more importantly the why, so that we can begin as a congregation, as a people, this summer, to make our lives about praise, to make our lives about thanks, as a group, as a people. That is our challenge.